Hare Krishna. So today morning, I'll discuss on the topic of how intelligence and devotion interact on the journey towards liberation. How both of them play their roles in taking us beyond illusion, beyond temptation towards liberation. And I'll speak three points. First point is that not everyone can be intellectual, but everyone can be intelligent. The second point I talk about is how <clears throat> intelligence is a component of devotion, not a competitor to devotion. And the last point will be that let intelligence be your minister, not your master. So let's look at these points one by one. So here the context is that the Lord is uh, uh, he's telling Prithu Maharaj, Prithu Maharaj has offered prayers to Lord Vishnu who has appeared in the sacrificial assembly to receive his sacrifice. And after that, Prithu Maharaj has glorified Lord Vishnu with prayers. And Lord Vishnu is saying that through your prayers, you have exhibited intelligence. And may you always manifest devotion the way you have manifested now. And by such devotion, you will, the such devotion is the way to go beyond illusion, to go towards liberation. In fact, it's the only way, he says. So let's look at, so he, the context over here is that the Lord is saying that the way you, the prayers that you offered to me and the actions that you did, that is, when he could have insisted on performing the hundred sacrifice, but he let go of it. So it's significant that there is the activity of sacrifice and there is the mentality of sacrifice. So the activity of sacrifice is that when some yajna is performed, at that time, something which is dear for us, we offer it into the fire sacrifice. So the idea is, what could be used for our own enjoyment? It could be ghee, it could be grains, it could be silk, whatever it is. We use it, we put it in the sacrificial fire. What could be used for our enjoyment, we give it for a higher cause. So, now, Sacrifice is a ritual, it's a practice, it's a ceremony which is important. But the essence of that is that one has to have a sacrificing mentality. And so we can say that Prutu sacrificed his sacrifice. Prutu, what did he do? He sacrificed, means gave up the idea of doing a hundred sacrifices. The sacrifice did not please Lord Vishnu as, as much as the sacrifice of the sacrifice. So when he gave up the sacrifice, that pleased Lord Vishnu more than doing the sacrifice. Why? Because that avoided conflict between him and Indra. So, so the Lord is saying in this way, when you manifested some selflessness, some sacrificing mentality, this intelligence that you showed is, has pleased me. The intelligence through your actions and through your prayers has pleased me. And thus, I bless you that you may bhakti rastu, that may you have devotion. And by that devotion, maya madhyam taratis madhustyajam, you will be able to cross beyond the illusory energy. So now, <coughs> many people, so the first point I am discussing in this context is, that not everyone can be intellectual, but everyone can be intelligent. Intellectual refers to a person who has a lot of information processing ability. They can remember a lot, they can quote a verse from here, they can quote a reference from there, they can remember this point, that point, that point. Now that is an intellectual. So intellectuals are primarily defined by the capacity to memorize, by the capacity to recollect, and by the capacity to analyze, to categorize, to synthesize. Basically, to do a lot with information. 
and somebody can be a scientist who may be an intellectual, somebody can be a religious scholar who can be an intellectual, somebody can be a scriptural scholar who can be an intellectual. Now this information processing ability is something which is more or less we could say a Brahminical quality. We know there are four broad human types. You could call them as the <coughs> Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudras. There are, so they are, these are not just cars, they are human types. Generally, those who are of the Brahminical nature, they have good intellectual ability. And the remaining Varanas, Kshatriyas, Vaishya, Shudras, they may or may not have that much intellectual ability. So, not everybody can be an intellectual because that is a gift that some people get by past karma. But everybody can be intelligent. Now, intelligence is essentially decision making ability. The ability to discern right from wrong and to choose the right course of action. The ability to discern between the short term and the long term, the material and the spiritual, the impulsive, uh, something which feels impulsively good and something which is actually good in the long run. So that capacity to differentiate is intelligence. And, the, and this is what Krishna talks about in the 18th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita also when he says, that intelligence means to understand pravrittim cha nivrittim cha karya karye bhaya bhaye bandham moksham cha yaveti buddhi sapartha sattviki The buddhi, intelligence means pravrittim cha nivrittim cha what I should do and what I should not do. Karya karye bhaya bhaye This action is fearful. It is such an action, I should be afraid of doing it. And this action, I should not be afraid of doing it. Abhaye, bandham moksham chaya vetti. That, that this will cause me bondage. And this will lead me to progress, towards liberation. So understanding all this about action, this is intelligence. So it's interesting, that Krishna is talking about pravritti nivritti. Pravritti nivritti means, broadly speaking, that which we are inclined to do and that which we are disinclined to do. Karya, karye, bhaya, bhaya, with respect to action. Some actions we are inclined to do, some actions we are disinclined to do. And similarly, some actions, now inclination you could say is innate. Just uh, Some people, just as soon as they come to a place, they will look around at the aesthetics. And if something is untidy, they will start sorting it up. Some people have natural, say, visual intelligence or home-keeping intelligence. Some people, if they are seeing some text, immediately they will say, okay, verbal intelligence, this is not written so well, this is written nicely. So all of us have certain innate tendencies. Now, not all innate tendencies are to be acted on immediately. So that's when to act, when not to act. Now, another thing, bhaya bhaya refers to our emotional reaction to certain actions. I can't do this. I will do this. I want to do this. So now, based on the kind of society we are living in, certain actions may be frowned upon, maybe may lead us to trouble. So now, sometimes they may be the right action, but doing it may cause trouble. Say for example, in certain parts of the world, there is no religious freedom. And if somebody tries to live according to their faith, they may be persecuted, they may be tortured. They may even be executed. So now, naturally, there will be some fear at that time to profess one's faith. And there might be a tendency to deny or conceal one's faith. So now, we may have some sudden, by default, fear of certain actions. But if it is the right thing to do, still we will do it. We may not do it publicly, but we will continue doing it. So, what is to be feared and what is not to be feared is not necessarily determined by what we fear and what we don't fear. They are two different things. There are certain things which we fear, but that need not be feared. So what is to be feared and what is to not be feared is not necessarily determined by what we fear and what we don't fear. So a child may not fear running in the middle of the street, but that should be feared. And 
a person who is living in an atheistic country or a aggressively anti-theistic country may fear practicing their religion but that should not be feared we should still continue our practice discreetly but still we should continue it so krishna is saying that this capacity to discern what is we should do and what we should not do so first krishna is talk about innate inclination and second talks about krishna talks about the our emotional reaction and third he talks about the consequence bandham moksham cha yavetti that what will lead to bondage and what will lead to liberation based on that we can decide which action to do and which action not to do so this capacity to discern right and wrong course of actions that is intelligence and this every human being needs to have we everyone can have everyone needs to have because everyone does make decisions and if we are not having intelligence then we may make bad decisions so not everyone can be an intellectual in terms of having phenomenal information processing capacity not everybody can remember verses not everybody can, can quote from here quote from there not everybody can have a great memory or a great analytical ability but in terms of decision making should i do this should i not do this that is intelligence and everyone can be intelligent so not everyone can memorize scriptural verses we all can try as much as possible but the essential scriptural message of how to mold our life that is something we all can learn from scripture and we can use that in our spiritual life not just in our spiritual life even in our day to day life so the study of scripture is meant to make us intelligent and some of us will become intellectual but even if we can't become intellectual we can all become intelligent and it is this intelligence that is manifested through the practice of bhakti so when we have that capacity to discern then we understand that actually krishna is the ultimate object of love for me and let me devote myself to him whether i feel like it or i don't feel like it let me persevere in the practice of bhakti because emotions are fickle they will come and go but life's realities are not determined by our present emotions about those realities so let that capacity to persevere comes from our intelligence so this is the first point that not everyone can be intellectual but everyone can be intelligent so any reflections on this Yes. The wonderful distinction between intelligence and intelligence. And you said you have both of your speech that this is this intelligence is very important to actually have. Uh, then I was thinking about how to get this. Mm. And uh, and you also said that uh, practicing bhakti, uh, this intelligence can be. Uh, <coughs> one should have this intelligence. And uh, by practicing bhakti, one can get very satisfied. Yeah. Okay. And I was also thinking of the verse in Bhagavad Gita 2.66, which also says something of this kind. Of, Beautiful. Yes. Strong intelligence, the connecting with the Lord, is a strong intelligence. The strong intelligence leads to a stable mind. The stable mind leads to peace, and peace to happiness. Excellent. Yes. Nasti buddhi ayuktasya, acha ayuktasya bhavana, acha bhaveta shanti, acha antasya bhuta sukham. Krishna says. If you are not connected with the divine, then you cannot have steady intelligence. So yes, intelligence we can all develop by practicing bhakti. Thank you. So any other reflections or questions? Okay. So the second point I was going to speak on is that intelligence is a component of devotion, not a competitor to devotion. So there is gyan and there is gyan a marga. So gyan is knowledge. Gyan a marga is the path of knowledge. So every devotee has to have gyan, but a devotee is not a gyani in terms of a follower of a gyan a marga. So gyan. So that means knowledge is something which everyone requires. What even if somebody is not a spiritualist also. even if somebody is a barber or a carpenter or a cobbler they also need knowledge so knowledge is someone everything something everyone needs but when we talk about gyan as in gyan marga 
that is the knowledge which is where analysis and knowledge are seen as the sole means to spiritual realization to spiritual growth so that often in our scriptures like here also Prabhupada says is it called a speculative knowledge speculative philosophy that no one can go beyond illusion by speculative philosophy so this is Jnana Marga and Jnana Marga is something which is often seen as in competition with Bhakti Marga so if somebody pursues spiritual growth only through analysis only through discernment only through intellect but doesn't practice anything. Their only practice is analysis. Then that is not a sustainable way for most people to move spiritually. So that's what. So if somebody is considering jnana as a component of jnana marga, then it becomes a competitor to devotion. And why a competitor? Generally, the more we exercise our intelligence, and the more we are able to exercise our intelligence effectively that means using our intelligence we are able to make sounder decisions then that tends to create within us a sense of superiority over others I know this answer, they don't I can analyze this, they can't so by if all that we do is analysis then gradually that starts creating within us a sense of superiority over those whom we who can't analyze as well as we do and analysis also me it leads to the focus on the idea that okay all this is matter and i am spirit and therefore i am above all this so by analysis one puts oneself above the material world and one puts oneself above people who most of them are materialistic and this way often analysis can reliance only on intellect reliance only on the jnana marga on intelligence alone not the intellect usually people who follow the jnana marga they are not just having intelligence they have intellect because they can keep analyzing this like this this like this this is like this so they often have their own sense of ego increased by that because they think I am superior to everyone else now there is a difference between uh, say we are an example see we all, it's all it's said that we are all meant to set examples for others now when we say set an example for others this is how we should act so when we set an example for others, that doesn't mean we are better than others. It means we are an example of something better. We are not someone better. We are an example of something better. What is the difference between the two? That we are someone better means you are down here and I am up here. We are an example of something better. That means when we try to practice the principles of Bhakti Yoga diligently, and by that our consciousness rises, by this our intelligence rises, by there our morality and virtue and our conduct improve, then we are an example of the potency of devotion. So we want to be, we don't want to be better than others. We want, we want to be a better example than others. We want to be an example of something better. So otherwise, just the attempt of setting an example can also lead to the increase of the ego. Say, I wake up early in the morning. This person doesn't wake up early in the morning. I fast on Ikadish. This person doesn't fast. I do this austerity. This person doesn't do it. I may say, I am doing this as, as to set an example for you. But you are not following my example, therefore you are following. So, even setting an example can be done out of ego or it can be done in a mood of service. So, the difference, defining difference is when we set an example, if our vision is downwards, all these people, I am setting an example for them. Then we are putting ourselves above. But if our example is upwards, no, Bhakti Devi is far greater than me. Krishna is far greater than me. And Bhakti and Krishna can elevate even a soul like me. And therefore, I am letting Bhakti Devi 
principles of devotion manifest through me by practicing the disciplines then the vision is focused higher so this is the difference between bhakti and jnana in bhakti also we use our intelligence but in bhakti the vision is not focused on others the vision is focused on krishna so because the vision is focused on krishna the more a devotee practices bhakti the more a devotee does analysis that analysis leads to an increasing awareness of krishna's greatness so this is a whole big subject how jnana in the bhakti marga and gyan in gyana marga how they are different jiva goswami talks about this elaborately in the shat sandarbhas in the first sandarbha it's tatva sandarbha i won't go into all that but this one point i will focus that uh if one simply does analysis without having a vision of something higher then all that it makes us see is that i am superior but when the purpose of our analysis is to shift our vision to something higher then the more we analyze the more we understand how much krishna is greater than me yes i may be presently better than others but my vision is not focused on how i am better than others my vision is focused on how krishna is so much greater so the analysis and devotion leads to an increasing appreciation of krishna's glories and when that happens the analysis brings humility <clears throat> generally the people who know a little bit they often become proud of their knowledge but people who know a lot they actually become humble this is a standard example is okay <laughs> einstein yes we have trees trees that are filled with flowers with fruits they bow down the trees which are completely barren they go tall so generally when a tree is laden with fruits and flowers it bows down so basically what happens is that the more we truly develop knowledge in any field in general then at one level knowledge may make us think i know so much but if we truly develop knowledge then we understand there is so much more to know there is so much more to know now a child who starts learning mathematics the child learns a little algebra little that learns a few tables and thinks i know so much it's good to have a sense of achievement that i learned something but if they think i know everything but then there is so much more to know so if we look at all that we know we can become proud i know so much but if we look at how much more there is to know then we will become humble the same way in gyana marga what the gyani sees see this illusion i rejected this temptation i rejected this misconception i have overcome and this way they see how much they have come to know how much they have overcome and that leads to a sense of superiority and ego but for a devotee a devotee is focused always on there so much i don't know krishna's glories are infinite infinite and thus it is that arjun says that my dear lord even if i hear even your glories are such that i know i cannot hear them for it i cannot know them in full but at least as an example tell me something about your glories eshu tum dehita prokt and that's what krishna also says as an indication i will tell you so the so when intelligence makes us think that i know so much then that intelligence can become a competitor to our devotion because that intelligence makes us direct our vision towards the world see i know this i know this it look directs our vision towards people in the world and makes us think i know so much more than that but when intelligence is used to direct our vision towards krishna then intelligence enables us to increase our appreciation for krishna just like all of us many of us are from india so we may have grown up with hearing some stories about krishna in our childhood and it's nice we know something about krishna 
But then when we understand the philosophy of Krishna consciousness, then Krishna doesn't stay just as like a, maybe a Hindu god or an entertainment character. When you say Krishna is the ultimate reality, he is the object of enlightenment. So, he is the ultimate objective of enlightenment actually. So that understanding is, it deepens our appreciation of Krishna. Earlier, even just here, her, saw some, maybe some TV serials about Krishna. We may have thought of Krishna as an object of entertainment. And there is this cartoon character, there is this character, there is this TV serial. Krishna is also one of them. Maybe a little more pious, a little more religious. But Krishna is an object of entertainment. But when we get knowledge, then we understand Krishna is not an object of entertainment. He is the objective of enlightenment. The enlightened souls devote themselves to Yoma meva sampudho janati purushottamam sa sarva vid bhajati ma sarva bhavein bharata That the, those who truly know they devote themselves completely to Krishna. It's 15.19 in the Bhagavad Gita. So this is the second point that when intelligence makes us think that I know so much then that becomes a competitor to devotion but when intelligence makes us feel that there's so much more to know about Krishna and about Krishna's energy in this world then intelligence becomes a component of devotion because it stimulates us to deepen our appreciation for Krishna so any reflections or any questions about this yes uh, about the Beautiful. Yes. If you have a reasoning ability, just, just appreciate the mercy. It's uh, see, suppose some a child doesn't even know the value of currency, and somebody gives them a lot of currency. And they say, okay, I got something. But somebody who has the, who understands the value of currency, and somebody gives them a lot of currency, they'll count. And they'll appreciate how incredibly generous this person is. So like that, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy is so extraordinary. If we have intelligence, so anybody, even a child who doesn't appreciate the value of currency, can also be enriched by the currency. The child may not appreciate the magnitude of the enrichment. But somebody who has understanding of currency, then they analyze, they understand the magnitude of the gift. The same applies to mercy. So, the greater the intelligence we have, the greater we can appreciate the magnitude of Shav Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy. Beautiful. Thank you. Yes? Uh, no, the difference between the Jnana of Jnani and the difference between the Jnana that we use for Bhakti is that they both have different purposes. So, purpose is very important for Bhakti. Uh, for Bhakti Yogi, uh, the goal is Krishna, while for the Jnani, the goal is actually to analyze things, but ultimately their focus is on I. I know this, I know that. Mm. But for uh, for Chan, it's uh, Krishna, they use their uh, intelligence and uh, uh, to know Krishna. Mm. That's why, you know, what we know, what we know is not as important as what we want to know. Somebody may know a lot, but all that they want to know is how much people know how much I know. <laughs> they don't want to know Krishna. Somebody may know a little, but they may want to know Krishna. So some people have knowledge, but the goal of their knowledge is to A, earn worldly praise. Somebody may have little knowledge, but the goal of their knowledge is, uh, is Krishna. So what we know is not as important as what we want to know. Yeah. So let's move on to the last point now. The second point I discussed was that let intelli when let intelligence be a component of devotion, not a competitor to devotion. And related to that only the same. The third point is on our on the devotional path, let intelligence be the minister, not the master. So minister means the intelligence, just like if a king has a minister, the minister is the advisor. Okay, you know, I think we should do this. Maybe we should not do this. Now, the intelligence is wise, the minister is wise, then definitely 
the king will be is blessed to have a wise minister like that at the same time the minister is not a decision maker it is the king who is a decision maker so similarly for us our intelligence is a very important guide for us on the spiritual path at the same time the intelligence as i said intelligence it helps us to make the right decisions and in that sense intelligence is very important but intelligence alone cannot be the decision maker why not because <clears throat> krishna is so great that he is beyond the intelligence now when we say he is beyond the intelligence doesn't mean that we have to give up the intelligence there's a difference between giving up the intelligence and going beyond the intelligence and so if you could say there is that is intelligent below that is unintelligent and above that is trans intelligent we could say there is rational there is irrational but there is a trans rational so what do we mean by above the intelligent above the intelligence jeev goswami again says in the sandarbhas that if our intelligence alone could understand god if our intelligence alone could understand the supreme then the intelligence would become the supreme if our intelligence alone can understand the supreme then that means the intelligence is superior to the supreme the intelligence can conquer the supreme which is not possible so the intelligence can aid us in understanding many things about the supreme but if we put the supreme to intellectual scrutiny alone and we think that the intelligence the supreme has to be subordinate to our intellectual scrutiny then that is a uh, that is a incomplete understanding of both the supreme and intelligence now what do i mean by this if you consider the brahma vimohan leela in the 10th canto of the shrimad bhagavatam is described how brahma at one time saw krishna playing with his friends and krishna was playing with his friends that the madhumangal who was one of his brahmana friends had brought some buttermilk some chaaj Now Madhu Mangal is from a little poor family, so the buttermilk that he had brought was not that good. And of course, he also likes to he likes Madhu Mangal is a, he loves to eat. So when Madhu Mangal got the buttermilk, he he drank it, and he thought, okay, Krishna has got so many other foods to eat, and this is not such a, of such a good quality. So he said, if we all sit and take the food together, at that time, then Krishna will also ask for. what is there in my my container and i had to give this to him this is not worthy of krishna so he said this is not good enough for krishna to take so thinking like this he just as they were about to take their food or sit down and take he sneaked away and he went behind a bush and there behind that bush he sat down and started drinking the water milk all and krishna looked at him and krishna hey madhuman where is he gone he said searching and as he came he saw madhu mangal drinking buttermilk and krishna had running towards him and when krishna saw that when madhu mangal saw that he is coming and what madhu mangal did was suppose we are drinking something and then we want to finish it hastily so just pour it into the mouth so when he poured it into his mouth then his cheeks swelled up and then krishna came running over then madhu mangal thought i have drunk all of it now now krishna cannot eat it but krishna came running <laughs> krishna <laughs> tapped his cheeks now when krishna tapped his cheeks at that time the buttermilk came out of his mouth and some of the buttermilk fell on krishna's arms and then krishna picked up a little bit and licked it and when brahma ji saw this he got a culture shock <laughs> he said this is god How can God 
drink something that has come out of someone's mouth. It's so dirty. Normally, if somebody is puritanical, they'll be angry. Your, your, your spit has come out of my body. They'll immediately want to go and take a bath to cleanse themselves. But leave alone taking a bath. Krishna was angry. They can't drink it. Hey, what is this? It's couldn't process it. God. How, how can this be God? So the idea is that you know, first we have to understand God's position. Then understand God's action. If you go the other way, if you look at first in God's action, and then how can this be God? Then we misunderstand. Because Krishna here, yes, normally there are definitely uh, rules of purity and rules of cleanliness, rules of sanitation. But Krishna acts on the platform of love. And here he wanted to reciprocate in a loving way with Madhu Mangal. And Madhu Mangal thought that this milk, this buttermilk is not good enough for Krishna. But Krishna wanted to say that, you know, your mother has prepared it, you have brought it, I want to have it. So it was a loving exchange. Out of love, Madhu Mangal felt that I should not give it to Krishna. And out of love, Krishna felt that I should have it. So this kind of love may not always be subject to logical analysis. There are many occasions in Krishna Leela where Krishna does something which with our intelligence we will not be able to understand. And not just in Krishna Leela, it's also in our own lives. Sometimes we do one thing and something entirely different, something terrible happens. You say, why is God letting this happen? I'm praying to God, but why is God not helping me? So if we think that we can understand God's ways by our own intelligence, then that is a misunderstanding about both God and intelligence. So if we, <clears throat> if we let our spirituality, let our devotion be stuck within the limitation of what our intelligence can understand, then our devotion can become hamstrung. Our devotion can become limited. Because wherever things don't make sense with our intelligence, we will immediately become averse to it. Now, of course, we say, we say things should make sense according to the intelligence. Yes, they should and they will. But not always immediately. Just as in any field of knowledge, we approach with some humility. That if somebody is studying physics, then they understand physics is not that easy to understand. In fact, there's a quantum physicist who said that if you think you have understood if you think you have understood quantum physics, you are totally confused. <laughs> <laughs> so, quantum physics, one of the principles in quantum physics is that it's extremely difficult to understand. And those who study quantum physics they, they know how complex it is. So, now still, there are many aspects of quantum physics that do work. And that's why much of our technology is based on quantum physics. But still, in terms of understanding the fundamental concepts of quantum physics, it takes a long, long time. So, in any serious field of knowledge, we definitely use our intelligence. But we also understand that there is much that is beyond our intelligence. And acknowledging that is not rejecting the intelligence. Acknowledging that is simply respecting the glory of reality. So when physicists say that, oh, we don't know this, they are not rejecting the value of physics. They are saying the universe is so complex that we have not understood it. So similarly, when we say that in Krishna Bhakti there is something which we cannot understand, that is not rejecting the intelligence. That is, respecting the glory of Krishna and respecting the glory of Krishna Bhakti. The trans-intelligent is not a rejection of the intelligence, it is, a, it is a respect of the glory of Krishna. And this way, when we practice Bhakti, if some things don't make sense with our intelligence, then we needn't dwell on them, we needn't obsess on them. But we don't have to, we don't have to reduce our devotion to that. that the, unless I understand this, I will not move forward in Bhakti. No, even if I don't understand this, there is so much that more that makes sense, let me move forwards. In fact, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, I'll conclude with this point. 
ಭಕ್ತಿನ ಠಾಕೂರ್ ರೋಟ್ ಹಿ ಗಿವ್ ಅ ಟಾಕ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಭಾಗವತ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿ ಹಿ ಟಾಕ್ಸ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಬ್ಯೂಟಿಫುಲಿ ಅವರ್ ದೇರ್ ಟು ದ ಇಂಟೆಲೆಕ್ಚುಲ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ದ ಭದ್ರಲೋಕ ಅಬೌಟ್ ವಾಟ್ ಆಲ್ ಆರ್ ದ ಚಾಲೆಂಜಸ್ ಇನ್ ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡಿಂಗ್ ದ ಭಾಗವತ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹೌ ಟು ಡೀಲ್ ವಿತ್ ದ ಚಾಲೆಂಜಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿ ಮೇಕ್ಸ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಸ್ಟ್ರೈಕಿಂಗ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ಫಿಫ್ತ್ ಕ್ಯಾಂಟು ಕಾಸ್ಮೊಲಜಿ ಆಫ್ ದ ಭಾಗವತಮ್ ಇಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಡಿಫಿಕಲ್ಟ್ ಟು ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಎಸ್ಪೆಷಲಿ ಫಾರ್ ಸಂಬಡಿ ಹೂ ಕಮ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಅ ಎಂಪಿರಿಕಲ್ ಸೈನ್ ಸೈಂಟಿಸ್ಟ್ ಸೈಂಟಿಫಿಕ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ವ್ಯೂ ದಟ್ ಕಾಸ್ಮೊಲಜಿ ಮೇ ಸೀಮ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಟು ಫಾರ್ ಔಟ್ ನಾವು ದೇರ್ ಆರ್ ಆಫ್ ಕೋರ್ಸ್ ವೇಸ್ ಇನ್ ವಿಚ್ ಇಟ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬಿ ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟೂಡ್ ಬಟ್ ಭಕ್ತಿನ ಠಾಕೂರ್ ಸೇಸ್ ದಟ್ ದ ಫಿಫ್ತ್ ಕ್ಯಾಂಟ್ ಕಮ್ಸ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ದ ಟೆಂತ್ ಕ್ಯಾಂಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ಐಡಿಯಾ ಈಸ್ ದಟ್ ಸಂಬಡಿ ಹೂ ಈಸ್ ವರ್ಷಿಪಿಂಗ್ ಎಟ್ ದ ಆಲ್ಟರ್ ಆಫ್ ರ್ಯಾಷನಾಲಿಟಿ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಬ್ಲಾಕ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ದಟ್ and will not come to be able to worship krishna and the 10th canto now rationality is definitely important but you don't want to make rationality as a god whom we worship for us the god is krishna and rationality is also one paraphernalia one ingredient in our tool for worshiping krishna so if we worship at the altar of rationality then we can't worship we can't come to the level of worshiping krishna steady because constantly we are this doesn't make sense this doesn't make sense and because this doesn't make sense i'll give up krishna bhakti no this doesn't make sense that simply indicates that i am finite and krishna is infinite maybe by krishna's mercy in future this will make sense to me but still i will keep worshiping krishna so just like if say we are doing if you want to do aarti we want to do worship of the lord and we are using a lamp for it Now normally we move the lamp around the Lord. But suppose we are in an open place where there is a lot of wind over there. Then if we try to do an aarti with a lamp, the lamp will get extinguished immediately. Now when we have some open air kirtans or open air puja, at that time often uh, devotees don't use a lamp. They may use an incense over there. They may use some other stick. whose flame doesn't move forward up like that and doesn't get extinguished so in particular situations we may not be able to worship with the lamp but we worship with the flowers we worship with the incense sticks we worship with water we worship with other paraphernalia so similarly in some situations we may not be able to worship with the with the paraphernalia of the rational intelligence so it's only in some situations normally rationality is also something to be used in krishna's service so let intelligence be our minister not our master and if we have this ministerial attitude then krishna says that the more we use our intelligence the more we are worshiping him adishyate cha yamam dharmam samvadam avayo jnana yagyena tena ishtasyamiti mehmati in 18.70 70 krishna says that those who study this sacred conversation of ours those who study the bhagavad gita they are worshiping me with their intelligence so bhakti is not just about emotion bhakti is about using all our faculties to connect with krishna our emotion and our reason and when we have that intention of devotion that purpose of devotion then even our reason becomes a paraphernalia becomes a tool an object with which we worship krishna and thus both our heart and our head can unitedly take us towards krishna so i summarize i spoke on the topic of <clears throat> how intelligence and devotion together take us towards in towards liberation towards krishna ultimately so the first point was that <clears throat> that not everyone can be intellectual but everyone can be intelligent intellectual intellectual refers to one with information processing ability and brahmanical people have that those who are not brahmanical can still be intelligent which means they can make decisions soundly and talk about we make decisions based on our innate inclinations our reflexive emotions and our perception of the consequences so to know whether to act on our emotions to know whether to act according to our inclinations to know how to see the consequences all this comprises intelligence and all of us need intelligence to take 
to do responsible decision making and the study of scripture and especially the practice of bhakti can make us intelligent even if they don't necessarily make us intellectual the second point was that let intelligence be a component of devotion not a competitor to devotion so the jnana in jnana marga focuses on in the path of knowledge alone the focus is on trying to reject illusion reject temptation through discrimination and we think that i have seen through this temptation i have seen through this temptation and people are not able to see through it so we think we are superior to illusion and we are superior to people who are in illusion and that can increase the ego which is not very conducive to spiritual growth so in bhakti mar we use the intelligence but the focus is not on illusion focus on krishna so by analysis within the path of analysis our sense of superiority increases because we think i know so much but by analysis on the path of devotion because our vision is fixed on krishna we understand that there is so much to know krishna is so much greater than me so the greater the analysis the greater the humility we get understanding our smallness understanding how much more there is to know beyond what we know and the greater is our appreciation of krishna understanding how great he is so such intelligence used as a component of devotion is very healthy it can increase our appreciation for krishna and the last point was let intelligence be a minister not the master so minister means we take intelligence as a very important input for pursuing the spiritual path but we don't let our spiritual journey become a hostage to our intelligence so if some things don't make sense then we approach it with humility saying that okay this is bigger than me and i am small not that this doesn't make sense so this whole path i will give so if we think that by our intelligence we should be able to understand the supreme entirely then that means we are we we are committing the logical fallacy of considering our intelligence as greater than the supreme so the uh, krishna it is to go beyond the intelligence is trans intelligent to give up the intelligence is unintelligent so we don't go beyond give up the intelligence rather we go beyond the intelligence and we see intelligence as a important paraphernalia in our worship of the lord we don't make intelligence the object of worship we use intelligence to work, to worship the object of worship that is krishna and just like sometimes we may not be able to use a lamp in a windy place to worship uh, similarly in particular situations rationality may not be the best tool for approaching the supreme then we put it aside and we focus on connecting with the lord whether with our rationality or beyond our rationality in this way we march ahead on the spiritual path using all our faculties our head and our heart thank you very much hare krishna any questions or comments yes the prabhu if you want to be part of scan if somebody is more intellectual than other people how do we understand if somebody is more intellectual than other people okay we can easily understand if somebody is more intellectual but how can we understand if somebody is more intelligent if that requires observing people a little more closely that means if we live with someone if we see somebody day after day month after month year after year and then we see their their actions their behavior is it consistent with what they speak and how do they deal with impulsive emotions how do they deal with provocative people how do they deal with temptations how do they deal with distresses so if somebody just you know, temptation come they succumb to temptation if somebody gets angry somebody just yells at others so at intelligence we can see by looking at first people's actions for a long time that's why it is said that you know to commit to the welfare of one person is more difficult than to commit to the welfare of the millions because <laughs> if you say i want to do good to millions of people then we are not committed to any one person so we just appear in front of one person another person another person then we, we might just put on a mask before different people but somebody with whom we are staying continuously or regularly 
then sometimes the mask slips. So that's why it's people's actions, if you observe them over a period of time, and through that actions we can understand how much of their intellect has filtered down to the level of intelligence also. Thank you. Yes? Okay. Yes, correct. So is keeping faith a sign of the intelligence? Yes, definitely. It is just that, <clears throat> say, if you are taking some medicine, now normally, if you are taking a treatment for someone, the medicine should improve our health. But there are some treatments which initially may worsen the symptoms. Some homeopathic treatments are like that, some other treatments are like that also. That they may worsen the symptoms initially. At that time we need faith that okay, this is just a phase, eventually things will become better. So faith sees the process, not just the current results of the process. So the current results of the process may or may not be pleasant. But if we focus on the process itself and continue, that is the indicator of faith. So knowledge can help us to, to put faith. But knowledge alone itself does not translate into faith. Alone. Like some doctor may know, you know, okay, this medicine or this particular treatment is painful, but eventually I feel better. But that does not necessarily mean when the doctor has the disease, the doctor will necessarily take that treatment. The doctor will say, oh, this is too painful, I don't want to take it. It's unlikely to happen, but knowledge is more in terms of information. Whereas faith is a choice in terms of actions. So when we, when we have knowledge about how the process works, and then when we, when we are aware that sometimes some unexpected results might also come, then we choose to put faith and persevere in the process. Okay? Any other question? Yes? Good point, yes. Organizing intelligence are very important. You see, with, with intelligence and organization, we will be able to take the message of bhakti to many, many people. Without that also, we might ourselves practice bhakti and we may get purified. But we may, to reach Krishna, we have to have organizing intelligence. Because say, suppose we are organizing a program. Now, if the speaker and the organizers, both, all of them may be very devoted. But if they are not systematic in organizing the program, they don't publicize it properly. Well, maybe when the program comes, only the speaker and the organizers will be there. Nobody else will be there. And the program goes on, the speaker and the organizer, both of them will be purified by the program. But others will not be benefited. So if you want others to be benefited, then they have to organize properly, make sure that people are, it's publicized, people are invited. So yes, it's true. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so if our anarthas interfere with our intelligent practice of bhakti, our making wise choices in bhakti, what do we do? Yes, anarthas 
uh, say it could be anger it could be greed it could be envy it could be lust whatever else these all pop up within us at times and sometimes when they pop up they come so forcefully that our intelligence is knocked over so it's like uh, suppose a thief mm, is wants to rob a bank and the security guard at the door of the bank and a thief is thief is big and burly and comes suddenly and forcefully knocks aside the security guard and then the thief comes and robs and then the security guard is knocked off for some time and then comes back to consciousness and he picks up the gun and tries to ch chase the thief and the thief oh the security guard has come the thief runs away after that so that is the situation for most of us on the spiritual path that sometimes when the anarthas rise they knock aside our intelligence and some for some time we do something wrong but imagine the security guard comes back to consciousness security guard says the thief is robbing he is good chance i also rob <laughs> and the thief and the security guard both rob the bank and so if the thief somehow the thief has to normally sideline the security guard but if the thief can make the security guard an accomplice then it's a far more dangerous situation so similarly for us there are we all have moments of weakness where our intelligence like which is like a security guard is just sideline but the moments of weakness pass and then we are like oh, what did i do i shouldn't have done it then we just either we try to correct ourselves or we uh, do damage minimization we try to rectify the consequences and gradually by that we'll become more and more alert and then we will even the thief comes in the security guard will be able to protect so it will ha it will happen gradually it requires more alertness it requires more strength and as we keep practicing bhakti more and more they and study start studying shastra we learn to observe ourselves to see what situations we succumb to temptation then we will become more capable of resisting the anarthas that we have but within that we still keep practicing bhakti even if the anarthas temporarily arise see we may fall down we may fall down on the spiritual path or we may fall down we may fall in krishna consciousness but we need to fall in krishna consciousness not fall out of krishna consciousness fall out of krishna consciousness means that we give up the practice of bhakti like the security guard is fallen he gets up and starts guarding again but if we just give up this is not going to work so let me also give it up then that's what if that happens so people for whom their intelligence has become a tool of their anarthas that means they not only have envy but they systematically plan how to pull down the other person systematic plan is a blasphemy of someone character assassination of someone when they do that then that is not just weakness that becomes wickedness so when somebody has wickedness then it's it's much more difficult to rectify generally for us in the devotee circle most of us what we have is weakness and it's it's a gradual process so we we will our intelligence will sometimes be overcome but again we rise as soon as we realize it and over a period of time as our intelligence becomes stronger as we become more alert then those lapses will also become lesser and then we will live a more pure life okay thank you okay yes bro i'm telling you sometimes when uh, reading prabhupada books i have this tendency of when you book down you know in the book it is in the text Uh, 
Okay. So if we tend to get questions about technicalities, such as say Prutha Maharaj is said to appear from the churning of Vena body. So how is this possible? This may not seem logical to us. Yeah. So should we try to understand this or should we just put it aside the technicality? And how can how can we do that if we still feel that we need to understand it? See, this depends on need. Different people have different uh, natures, and some people are more analytical and intellectual than others. And so there is no uh, do this or don't do this in this case. There is no right or wrong. It's more of what is right for me or what is best for me, and what is not so good for me. If we look at broadly our traditions, now the Acharyas, if you look at Prabhupada, Vishwanachika Thakur, or Imperial Acharyas, they have studied scripture for primarily the purpose of developing love for Krishna. And that's what we have also come here for. So, now, Bhagavatam is primarily a guidebook for us for developing love for Krishna. And that needs to be our primary focus. At the same time, there are things which will just stand out for us. This doesn't, this, how, how is how to make sense of this? So, we can say that, actually I have a whole class on this topic, like reconciling science and scripture. But I'll put it briefly. We consider scripture knowledge to be like a big circle. In this circle, you can say there are three sectors. One sector is that which agrees with our say, scientific understanding. There is one sector which disagrees with our scientific understanding. And there is a third sector which transcends scientific understanding. So, what do I mean by transcend? Say, for example, beyond the material world, the spiritual world where there is a bluish black cowherd boy who is the ultimate reality. Now science can neither prove it nor disprove it. Because one of the driving functional assumptions of science is that it studies this world. That, that this world along with the forces interplaying in it, that they are the object of study of this world. So whether something exists beyond this world or not, that is out of scope for science, out of syllabus for science. So, the much of what is told in the Bhagavatam is actually that which transcends science. And if you look at our own lives, what we norm, what we primarily cherish in the Bhagavatam is that which transcends science. We have come primarily for that. When Parikshit Maharaj is about to die seven days in seven days and he's, he wants to hear about Krishna, he is not primarily interested in cosmology or in astro uh, in physiology or even in you could say different kinds of procreation techniques or reproduction techniques or whatever his primary interest is in remembering krishna so 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 both from the original context of the bhagavatam as well as from the from the uh, perspective of uh, the commentators, the focus and from our own lives, all three things, the focus is primarily on the third sector, which is the big sector actually, that which transcends science. Uh, now, having said that, that has to be a primary focus, but how do we deal with the other two? That Now, that which agrees with science, that is wonderful, there is no problem with that. Now, sometimes some devotees highlight that a lot to get people to have faith. Oh, see, oh, scriptures describes uh, the stages in the child's embryo, in the child, stages, in the, stages in the embryonic development in the mother's womb, that is called the third canto. Well, if that's true, it's described and it's remarkably accurate. But if you look at the context, the Bhagavad is not describing embryonic development. It's actually describing the prayers that the embryo offers to the Lord and in that course it's like a passing information that is given. So uh, the thrust is not that. Uh, so, there, so some, if we use if that information 
uh, which agrees with modern science can help somebody to gain faith in the Bhagavad. That is good. But during our study and during our outreach, we have to repeatedly stress that this is not the essence of the Bhagavad. The essence of this big sector. The big sector is that is transcends modern science. If we, sometimes some devotees try to prove that the Bhagavatam's knowledge is superior to scientific knowledge. The Bhagavatam's material knowledge is superior to scientific knowledge. Now, in some aspects, it may be. But, if we position scripture as a competitor to science, by that we devalue scripture. Scripture is giving us knowledge of another category. The category of, how, of what purpose to live for. What is the ultimate purpose of life? So science, with all its strength, science is immoral. Science is not immoral. Science is not moral. Science does not talk about morality. Or science can tell you that if you put arsenic in your grandmother's breakfast, can get your inheritance faster. <laughs> now, but whether to put that or not, that, that your chemistry textbook will not tell. Now, most scientists won't do it. But it's not science telling them, it's their moral sense telling them. They should not do this. So, science is neither, neither moral nor immoral, it is immoral. It just describes how the interaction of physical objects occurs and what are the results of that interaction. So, but ethically whether the political action should not be done or not, that is something which beyond us we study that with our innate moral sense. So, science, so, so the do, primary domain of scientific knowledge is the interaction of matter. Whereas the primary per focus of scripture is the development of consciousness. And because of this difference, if we position scripture as a competitor to science, then we are devaluing scripture. The scripture is giving us some other knowledge, primarily. And specifically, with respect to specific issues which we may not be able to understand. So, we need to consider, we need to consult those devotees who are also maybe more rational minded, more aware of science and then, they, from them we can get answers. Some devotees might just simply say, oh that is achintya, that is inconceivable. Now, well, inconceivable should not become like a mega umbrella to put together everything we don't understand. Inconceivable, yes Krishna is inconceivable and there are definite things about Krishna Bhakti and Krishna Tattva that are inconceivable. But, it shouldn't become a Inconceivable is a attribute of Krishna. It is not a tool for explaining away things that we don't understand. The difference between the two. So specifically with respect to this question, <clears throat> we see that now normally we think that the primary means of reproduction is sexual reproduction. The male and a female come together and they reproduce. And then, of course, there are some organisms which have asexual reproduction. Mm, that they just reproduce on their own without mating. So actually, one of the big mysteries in the evolutionary history of science is, you know, was sex necessary? Because if you, because actually sex, the need for sex for procreation puts the living being to a lot of vulnerability. You have to be vulnerable to get a mate. You have to be vulnerable in the time when you are obsessed with mating. If at that time some, some predator attacks or whatever. So actually mm, sex causes a lot of headache to evolutionists. <laughs> at some, in some ways. So if, if you see from the point of view of expediency and survival, a sexual reproduction is much more efficient than sexual reproduction. Now you could say that the mixing of genes happen and that's why that, in, that leads to greater vitality. But whether that is really necessary, whether that could be done through a sexual reproduction also because some amount of 
gene crossover can happen in that also? That's it's a question. I'll not get into that. But the important thing is that reproduction doesn't have to be limited to the means that we know right now. And now, for example, say 100 years ago, 200 years ago, <clears throat> if now we have intravenous fertilization, IVF, they did, people didn't know about that. So if we, with our technology, can develop means of reproduction which are different from what are the natural. So the Bhagavatam is not primarily a scientific text. So when it is said that by churning the body of Prithu, uh, when a Prithu was Prithu appeared, now what exactly that means? What is that churning? How was that churning done? None of that is described. Now if we think of that churning, you know, somebody just churning rod and churned his body. Well, we d I don't think it's as simple as that. So, see, generally, uh, technical procedures, when they are described in non-technical texts, say, okay, if, if somebody had a surgery, you know, so somebody might say that, you know, actually, uh, I had open heart surgery. Okay. But if somebody doesn't know what open heart surgery is, he says, the doctor cut my heart. What? The doctor cut your heart? And you're still alive? <laughs> How is that possible? So, what happens is that in non-technical context, technical procedures may be described in layman's language. And that might seem outrageous. Hey, How is this possible? But in technical context, it might be much more sophisticated. So we don't know exactly what that churning means. I doubt very much. As it's not just literal simplicity churning. If, if that were the case, then why doesn't the Bhagavatam describe that everybody who has died, they churn their body and they get offspring from there? It's not described like that over there. So basically, if our study of the universal science has taught us anything, it has taught us humility. That the universe is far more complicated than what we can perceive. And there are many things that may happen in the universe that our current conception of science can't make sense of. So, the famous, one of the pioneers of science, he said, that reality should not be reduced so that it fits into our knowledge systems. Rather, our knowledge system should be expanded so that it accommodates reality as it is. So, I would say science is a very powerful tool to reality, but it is one tool. And there can be much more to reality that our current science doesn't perceive. So, we don't have to go on a campaign to say that, that churning is inconceivable. But we don't have to say that this is all mythological or metaphorical or it is just, uh, it, it is just fantastic. No. There could be some mechanism that we don't know about. And if you want to, if, if such things trouble us, then we need to connect with those devotees who can give us a satisfactory understanding. Not every devotee will be able to give a satisfactory understanding. And with, in general devotee circles, uh, these questions may not be appreciated also. So, we have to, Bhakti Rata we have to find like-minded association. So that association will appreciate these kind of questions and will understand the need for getting answers. And they, they will provide an answer. At least we will see that, okay, many other people also have these questions. And uh, that also will give us, some, at least we are understood. Even if we don't understand, if we are understood, then that also gives us some solace. So, we don't want to focus on that on these kind of technicalities but if they just stand out to us while we are reading scripture then we need to have appropriate association uh, where we can get a reasonable explanation. So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada ki Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki Gaur Prema Anande